Good afternoon. Welcome to our guests. I'm J.W. Harrington, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of Washington, Tacoma. Welcome to William, William Philip Hall um, at, on our campus. <clears throat> We're really pleased to convene this discussion with representatives from three unique professions. Bringing diverse viewpoints to the table is what universities aim to do with the goal of educating, informing, and producing new knowledge from that intersection and innovations. To do that here with leading academic diplomats and military leaders is spot on to our campus mission as an urban serving university with relationships to our region's military presence. At our first symposium on President Obama's policy of a strategic rebalance to the Asia Pacific region, we were struck by the consensus across four diverse panelists on the importance of cultural competence and relationship building for effective engagement across the region. In this second symposium, we are bringing together three prominent individuals to build on this first conversation and to highlight the role of institutions and their leaders, and we're thinking about kind of organizational institutions and their leaders, as well as institutional policies, and the importance of international perspectives in shaping and not just reacting to in shaping this, imbalance, this rebalance. The strategic rebalance is putting a new spotlight on the Puget Sound area, and the state of Washington is indeed well positioned to influence the direction, not just the implementation, of these policies and to benefit from them. UW Tacoma is also well positioned, located within 15 miles of a major military base, and is part of one of the world's leading research universities located on the Pacific Rim to convene such a conversation and to play a large role. We are very pleased to have such strong community interest in these important issues, and are honored and thrilled to bring to the stage such a distinguished panel, which will be introduced shortly. I'd like to thank our sponsors and partners as some guests who made this all possible. Our sponsors include the Pierce Military and Business Alliance, the Tacoma News Tribune, and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. I'd like to thank our partner, Ron Chow, president of the Seattle Pacific Trading and Retail Restaurant Development, for his assistance with this event. And for publicizing the event, the National Bureau of Asian Research and the Tacoma World Trade Center. I'd like to recognize um, VIPs, including elected officials who um, may well be in the room. Um, if you are, please stand and we'll kind of recognize everyone with applause at the end. Uh, Nicholas Carr from Representative Kilmer's office, Patrick Ciccarelli, uh, Representative Adam Smith's office, Deborah Entman, Deputy Director from Representative Adam Smith's office, Roald Van der Lut, D District Director from Representative Denny Heck's office, Christine Reeves, Director of Military and Defense Sector at Washington State Department of Commerce, Major General Stephen Lanza, Commanding General for the 7th Entry Infantry Division at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Brigadier General Carl Turin, Deputy to Commanding General for First Corps at Joint Base Lewis McCord, Colonel Stephen Myers, Chief of Staff of First Corps at Joint Base, Han Hanshao, First Secretary, People's Republic of China Embassy in the United States, Karen Peterson, Executive Editor, Tacoma News Bune, Jeff Rediger, Vice Provost for Global Affairs at the University of Washington, Virgilia Riojas, UW Board of Regents, Herb Simon, UW Board of Regents, and any other elected officials. So if you could all who are here stand and let us appreciate your presence for being here. And of course, if there are any other elected officials who I did not recognize by name, please stand and don't be shy. Okay. Uh, I now will end by um, introducing our moderator. Professor Reshat Kasaba is the Stanley Golub Professor of International Studies and Director of the Henry M. Jackson School of International Studies for the University of Washington. He first came to the University of Washington in 1985 and over the past several decades has published widely, indeed authored or co-authored, co-edited eight books on the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey um, and state society relations in the Middle East overall. In 2010, his book, A Movable Empire, Ottoman Nomads, Migrants, and Refugees, 
won the book prize from the Turkish Studies Association, and he's also something that I care about deeply, a Distinguished Teaching Award winner um, at the University of Washington. So, Beshat, you would come forward. Come forward here, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, and thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Harrington. I am pleased to be here to guide this conversation about the rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region. I have a, brief, a few brief comments to help us begin with. Um, as many of you know, in President Obama's first term, both the President and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton signaled a foreign policy that was more focused on and engaged in in the Asia Pacific region than had been in the case that had been the case in the past decade with US involvement in Iraq and in Afghanistan originally this was described as a pivot policymakers however recently have emphasized that rebalance is more appropriate as this is not about turning away from other areas but rather is about a greater investment in the President's time and energy and the United States resources on the Asia Pacific. In the President's second term, there has been a greater focus on the role of economic partnerships and humanitarian assistance in this rebalance, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership discussions that are going on. Briefly, from the US perspective, the rebalance is defined as a comprehensive, multidimensional strategy that rests on strengthening alliances and deepening partnerships, building a stable and constructive relationship with China, empowering regional institutions, and helping to build a regional economic architecture that can sustain shared prosperity. A review of work by international relations scholars in China reveals a variety of perspectives on this policy. From those who identify it as a direct attempt to contain China, to those who understand it as more of an engagement and question of complementarity and competition. For Washington State, important aspects include a mission shift for First Corps at Joint Base lewis McCord, away from deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, and toward relationship building with counterparts across the Asia-Pacific region. And more locally, at the Port of Tacoma, the top importers and exporters in 2012 were China and Japan for a total of $34 billion in trade. Today, we have three distinguished guests to help us explore the role of leadership and international perspectives within the strategic rebalance with a keen eye on the impact of this on Washington state, a state that has a long history of relations and exchanges with Asia Pacific region. In bringing these guests together, we have three primary objectives. First, we want to educate and inform people about the diversity of exchanges between the state of Washington and Asia Pacific region in the context of the president's rebalance policy. Second, we want to provide an opportunity for conversations across unique and diverse professions. And third, we want to be innovative and creative in thinking about how we as a region and state can be proactive in shaping and in emphasizing the potential benefits from this policy. This might mean new initiatives and partnerships are suggested, new research questions posed, or new support is generated for existing and ongoing efforts. Now our plan for this afternoon is as follows. The panelists will begin by introducing their organizations and their work in relation to this rebalance. I will then pose questions and moderate discussion with the panelists. And then we will open it up for questions from the audience. We ask, and I will remind you this, uh, that you are, your questions are brief 
and uh, we want to have as many people as possible to participate in this conversation. Now, I'd like to uh, briefly introduce our distinguished panel. Minister Councillor Liu Weimin, Minister Councillor with the Chinese Embassy, he has spent his career in China's diplomatic corps with postings in Beijing, Mauritius, Euro Europe, Great Britain, and now the United States. Prior to his current posting as Minister Consular in the US, he was the spokesman for China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He received his training at China Foreign Affairs University in Beijing and was a visiting scholar at Stanford University's Hoover Institution in 2005. Lieutenant General Robert Brown, First Corps Commanding General, Joint Base Lewis McCord. He was commissioned as an infantry officer from the United States Military Academy. He has 32 years of experience in leadership positions at every echelon from platoon to corps. He has deployed twice in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and once in support of Operation Joint Forge in Bosnia. His focus at the Joint Base is on the Asia-Pacific rebalance with a strategy of partnership with Asia-Pacific militaries. He also holds degrees from the University of Virginia and National Defense University. University of Washington's President Michael Young became our leader at the university in July 2011. Having served previously as president of the University of Utah and a professor of law at Columbia University for 20 years. A legal scholar, he has published on topics including the Japanese legal system, international trade law and agreements, and human rights. President Young clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist and served as Deputy Undersecretary and Ambassador for Trade and Agricultural Affairs at the U.S. State Department under President George H.W. Bush. Young also twice chaired the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, of which he was a member between 1998 in 2005. So we have a truly a distinguished panel and each uh, will present unique perspectives on this very important question. President Young uh, reminded me and would like to remind all of us that his remarks are not necessarily representative of the University of Washington. <laughs> So with that, uh, I would like to ask now each panelist, um, and uh, I would like them to uh, describe uh, their current position and key responsibilities brief briefly. And also, uh, we will then go on uh, to uh, ask some questions relating their current uh, responsibilities to the rebalance uh, that's, that's occurring. Um, Prasad, thank you uh, very much <clears throat> for that kind introduction and that setup of uh, what I think is an important set of discussions. And I'm delighted to be here uh, and uh, want to thank all of you for joining us. I think there's some evidence that perhaps we don't need a rebalance to Asia with this, this level of interest in a, in a panel like this suggests that there is a, already a shift uh, underway that's an important one. But I also want to thank this community for the tremendous support they showed to this university. I think many of the great things that have happened here at the uh, University of Washington, Tacoma, have been very much the result of the people in this room. So thank you uh, for what you've done and to make, having made possible the wonderful education that this provides for these tremendous young people uh, here in this community. Um, my initial reaction as I was thinking about this, uh, since I've been going to and living in and studying Asia for, I think since 1969, before most of you were born, um, it occurred to me that what rebalance, we've been turned to Asia for a very long time. But the more I thought about it, I thought this is a very um, 
insightful and important issue to talk about. And it is because uh, as I have watched our relations uh, with Asia, it's clear to me that there has been some intense focus on the part of the United States, but it has been uh, relatively discreet and more limited than I think is useful. That is to say, I think the business community has discovered Asia uh, and did so many years ago, and there's a, a deep and intense range of activities across a very broad range of Asian countries. But I'm, I, I was struck by the fact that you mentioned I served in the, in the government, um, and I was struck by the fact that I might have been, even at my level, the highest political appointee who actually spoke any of the Asian languages. And that was a little unsettling to realize that uh, uh, even in a presidency as late as the first President Bush, that uh, the government wasn't rife with people who had spent a tremendous amount of time in Asia. And I don't think that has changed uh, as nearly as I can tell. Uh, in addition, I was thinking about the role of universities, and we have long had Asian studies programs. University of Washington, I think, has been particularly strong in many of those programs. Uh, but as I actually look at, nationally speaking, the number of students who have actually studied abroad, uh, it is obviously much smaller number than the number of foreign students who come to the United States and study. But in addition, if you line up the countries, the lineup is the United Kingdom, France, Spain, Italy, and then China. Uh, and so when you think about relative importance in terms of in the next 10, 50, 30 years, where our students are actually, the small number who are actually going abroad, where they are choosing to go and what they are choosing to study, uh, is not reflective of, I think, how the world has evolved and developed. And there, I think, it is hard to argue, in my judgment, that, that uh, a rebalance to Asia makes enormous sense. I know we are uh, obsessed, for obvious reasons, with the Middle East. But if you look at long-term economic, demographic, and political trends, uh, certainly Asia is where the center of the action is in many different ways. Not only in terms of the extraordinary growth in the economies one sees in those areas, uh, obvious in the case of Japan, Korea, and now obvious in the case of China, um, but the rapidity of that growth is remarkable and startling. I remember the first time I went to China in 1979 was in Shanghai and was standing on the bond with uh, a number of those old historic concession bank buildings and so forth behind me, somewhat dilapidated and so forth, and looked out across the Pudong, which was a swamp, literally a swamp, with uh, uh, some sampans and other boats there and reeds growing out of it and so forth. 20 years later, I'm standing in exactly the same point, there are a hundred, by actual count, a hundred skyscrapers uh, on that same land. It tells you something about the, about the remarkable acceleration of growth. But in addition, those countries are profound and important for another reason, which is they have managed an enormously rapid economic growth um, with relative stability and serve, I think, as a model for many other countries. And so as we are thinking about uh, trying to generate the kind of world that's likely to result in uh, more people having access uh, to all the things that we think are essential for people to really realize their full potential, the model that these Asian countries provide is really quite extraordinary. Uh, and yet not well understood in the United States if the other statistics I'm citing are really any indication so as I thought more and more about what we were talking about today, I realized how much I appreciated the opportunity to think about the role of the university um, in terms of a, of, a, of a significant focus. I've, as president, have made three trips abroad so far in my presidency. All three have been to Asia. Uh, and that, uh, I think, is reflective of where I think, as I understand the world, as I understand what, what we see happening in terms of the short-term, medium-term, and long-term uh, patterns and, and, and shifts, uh, how essential it is that we do, uh, we've done well what we do, but how essential it is that we do much, much more. Because if I'm right, and we see business making that shift, we see the government 
as always, very late to the game in making that shift. Um, but what about the people who are going to populate the government and the military and business? Uh, that shift hasn't really been made yet, and that gives us, I think, an opportunity as universities to think in a much more robust way about how we can help train people uh, who are going to be able to engage in that process. And we've done it, we've done it in a variety of ways, but the modestness of that uh, has really been impressed upon me over the past uh, the past few weeks as I have thought a lot about this panel discussion of what we're doing. So uh, happy to talk a great deal more about what I, th I think can be done. Um, I have some views on what the government ought to be d doing, but they never listened to me when I was in the State Department, so I have no reason to think they'll listen to me now. Uh, but look forward to this discussion to talk about this in more detail. Thank you, um, Vice Chancellor and Professor uh, Kasaba. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, prestigious uh, university. I'm uh, has been quite a while for me to come back to the campus since I left the university, so I feel a particular closeness uh, of uh, this invitation. Um, of course, uh, Washington State is not a stranger to China. I mean, I understand uh, China is the uh, largest trading partner of uh, this state, and this state is famous for a couple of uh, organizations, companies such as uh, Microsoft, Boeing, uh, Starbuck, uh, Amazon as well, and last but not least, uh, Gary Locke, who was your previous governor and uh, your previous ambassador. I, I just heard that he uh, just came back to uh, the States. I think he uh, was a great uh, ambassador of uh, the United States in uh, China. Um, this year, uh, January the 1st, actually uh, marks the uh, 35th anniversary of the diplomatic ties between our two countries. Um, it was uh, 35 years ago uh, when our I mean, two leaders took the uh, courageous decision to establish this uh, very important uh, relationship, uh, I think which uh, has uh, brought about profound uh, impact on uh, world uh, international relations as, as well as uh, world affairs. And the impact is uh, still going on. Uh, I recall that uh, almost uh, 35 years ago, uh, we took another, de in China, took another decision to open it up to the outside world. And we started the reform and, and open up progress. And I think these two uh, events are not coincidence. They are, I mean, closely intertwined. Um, I think it was a kind of a strategy for Chinese leader to uh, send a signal to the outside world, not just to the United States, that we want to have a uh, good international environment so that we can uh, move forward uh, with the uh, Op uh, opening up and reform. And after 35 years ago, now we are at another threshold. Uh, perhaps people uh, know that uh, November last year, uh, the uh, third plenary of the uh, 18 parties Congress uh, adopted a, uh, another courageous and com comprehensive uh, reform package involving, uh, I mean, a comprehensive sectors of uh, Chinese reform. And it was again last year when our two leaders met in uh, Sunny Land in California, where uh, they decided they reached a kind of a consensus to explore, uh, to establish a new model of major country relations. I think this is becoming a fashionable, I mean, world in Washington D.C. Everybody is talking about uh, this new model. What, what, what is the definition of uh, this word? What, what, is, what does it mean? Um, I'm happy to see that, but uh, uh, so I, I think uh, this once again is not, not a coincidence. I think it's a uh, significant. Um, so 
Actually, the United States is a witness of China's reform and opening up. And, and we believe that uh, our relations uh, played a very important part in our endeavor to move forward with that reform. <coughs> so now uh, the target is set and we are on the right way. So it's important for us, those uh, I mean, diplomats, uh, military, and of course educational institutions to work together uh, to make this relationship right. Um, as far as uh, Asia Pacific is concerned, the rebalancing, um, well, whether or not you use a pivot or rebalancing, I think for us, uh, the United States has never left Asia. Uh, you've been there for a long time. Uh, and we, of course, uh, respect I mean, the uh, interest of the uh, U.S. in this region. And we hope that uh, U.S. can continue to play a positive and constructive role in this region. Uh, I mean, it's just natural for the United States to perhaps uh, invest more in this region uh, so as to, I mean, which, which is the most dynamic region economically in the world, so as that the uh, U.S. can recover more quickly from uh, the repercussions of uh, the financial crisis. And when European Union and Russians, when they're talking about uh, more investment in this area, so it's just natural and normal for the United States to put more attention, focus on, on this region. So we hope that uh, in the process of the uh, U.S. Uh, uh, rebalancing policy, uh, we should further increase or strengthen our relationship uh, because we understand uh, cooperation uh, with China is a very important pillar of this rebalancing uh, policy. So we hope that uh, uh, this policy can, I mean, uh, offer more opportunities and potentials for us to cooperate. But of course, uh, we do have some concerns. Uh, let me be frank uh, with that. Um, I mean, the other day, you, uh, perhaps uh, there are a lot of people saying that uh, perhaps the U.S. put more emphasis on military aspects. Uh, well, uh, I feel close, and I was with, uh, uh, I have my respect uh, with the military because I came from a family with a military background. My father was a medic uh, in the uh, military. Um, and I understand that the uh, military is very well uh, disciplined, well organized. They always uh, move very quickly. So once the order is there, they move very quickly. And for the business community and for other institutions, maybe they, they are a little bit uh, lagging behind. So we don't blame the military for that. But of course, this is the 21st century. Uh, I mean, perhaps uh, we should have uh, a more balanced uh, policy, a more comprehensive policy uh, towards this region. And there are some people in China who uh, pose a kind of a question that uh, whether or not it's a kind of coincidence that uh, after the U.S. Uh, introduced this uh, rebalancing policy, uh, the tension in this region actually rose. I mean, China's relations with its neighbors, whether or not it's, this is a coincidence, uh, we hope so. Um, but uh, there are some uh, questions over there uh, what is the role of the U.S. I mean, in, in this region? Uh, does it want to see a stable uh, region uh, in the long term? Uh, I, we appreciate that uh, President Obama uh, repeat time and again that the uh, U.S. wants to see a prosperous, uh, developed, stable, a strong China. And because that's in the interest of the United States, we appreciate that and we believe that. Um, but it's important now for us to show, to work together and to show to the world that uh, uh, both of our two countries uh, want to make sure, I mean, we are the uh, stakeholders of uh, the efforts to bring uh, more prosperity and stability in this region. So we need to uh, work together uh, to demonstrate to 
the people who raise this, uh, these questions that uh, we can work together to ensure, I mean, a long-term uh, stability and prosperity in this region. Thank you. Thank you, Brown. Well, I'm uh, Bob Brown, and uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the University of Washington uh, for putting on this uh, forum. It's really terrific, and we're also uh, grateful for the partnership. Uh, we have a lot of veterans, uh, and I've, I've run into several in the audience uh, who are uh, attending university and really appreciate the great support to our veterans, and they have terrific uh, veterans groups as well, so here at UW Tacoma and at the Seattle campus. So thank you very much for putting this on. Uh, great opportunity. I, I'm going to. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for attending, except those in uniform. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, particularly, I'm taking notes. This has been very useful already because Minister Councilor Leo said how quickly the military moves. I've never thought my staff has moved quick enough. <laughs> so I'm glad they're here. A lot of them to hear that. But uh, uh, I'm going to try to put what we do military-wise, and, and please, at any point, if there's any questions, stop me if I'm, I'm trying not to use too many military terms. So I'm very fortunate to be the first Corps commander. Everybody's like, what the heck's a Corps commander? And, uh, a Corps is the operational level. There are three Corps in the Army. Uh, one in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, 18th Airborne Corps, one in Fort Hood, Texas, and then uh, the Corps here, First Corps. It's about 150,000 soldiers is about the max a Corps can take, and it could be as little as 20, 30,000 soldiers. Uh, and so th that's what a Corps is, and I'm very uh, privileged to be able to command the Corps. And really, uh, as we're talking about rebalance, in 33 years uh, of all the jobs I've come into, this was the easiest to determine what the vision for the command is because the Corps has been involved in uh, uh, tough work in Afghanistan and Iraq over the last 12 years. And General Scaparotti, the previous Corps commander, came back from Afghanistan where the Corps did a fantastic job. And, and you know, several weeks later, I took over. So it's very easy. It's the first time in my career I've ever got to implement national strategy of rebalance. The Corps is the rebalance for the Army in the military. Every service has. But really, the U.S. Army Pacific has been in the Pacific and has never left, as the minister said correctly. But uh, the Corps has, it, it hasn't been there. And we're supposed to be focused on the Pacific, but now we're back. Uh, so, and we're positioned perfectly for it, I might add. Being here in Washington, we're the closest Army base to a deep water port, actually several deep water ports, right here in Tacoma, Olympia. Uh, and then we're also co-located with an Air Force base, that's pretty good, and 52 C-17s that can get us where we need to go. So we're really in great position uh, of being here in Washington State uh, and uh, uh, being able to, to operate in the Pacific. Now, it is interesting also, uh, I'm very fortunate. I've had 12 years experience in the Pacific was when I was a captain all the way up to uh, my current assignment. And it's interesting, though, that things have changed because uh, many times in the past when I was uh, headed to the Pacific, folks would say, well, that's the end of your career. You're done. <laughs> because you're going way out there in the Pacific and, you know, the closer you are to the Pentagon or Europe is where things happen or the Mideast. In fact, when I was a striker brigade, I was one of the first striker brigade commanders here at Joint Base lewis McCord in early 2000. And when I left, I had a choice of going to the Pentagon or to Pacific Command. Pacific Command happens to be in Hawaii. The choice was very clear to me. And, <laughs> but as I got there, many folks did say, well, that's it. I had dozens of folks say, well, you're done. You know, that was a good choice. But I figured, what the heck, I'm in Hawaii. You know, so. Uh, but I'm actually very glad uh, that I've had the Pacific experience and very fortunate uh, because of, of the rebalance. And, and as was mentioned, it, uh, just a great uh, portrayal by the other two panelists on the significance uh, of the Pacific. Uh, so the, uh, the first corps is the only of the corps, the only ones assigned to a combatant commander. The other corps can go lots of places. We're actually assigned to Pacific Command, and we're focused solely on the Pacific region. We call it regionally aligned forces. So it's a big advantage for us. If you're going anywhere, it, you know, that's a pretty big mission. But for us, we can, you know, really learn the culture, really learn the languages, and really focus in on the Pacific region, a huge advantage uh, to us. We also bring, you know, one thing we've learned in the past 12 years of, uh, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan is that we will never do anything alone. You know, obviously, rebalance, as also has been mentioned, is a whole-of-government approach. And perhaps the military did move out 
pretty pretty quickly and maybe a little too quickly uh, in the beginning. It was a great point because uh, that's how we are. Can I give it a mission? Okay, we're going to get started on the mission. But it's we need all the services in the Pacific. Uh, and for us, though, the Army does bring some unique things, uh, incredible capability, logistics capability, uh, incredible medical capability, which both of those were just recently used in the... Uh, the typhoon in the Philippines, we sent right away some experts and some folks to help save lives. And so, you know, uh, we, we do bring some unique capabilities here at the Stryker Brigades here, a unique type brigade as well. Uh, and uh, a lot of options for the most likely thing we'll be involved in, which is a disaster response or humanitarian assistance to help save lives. Uh, but we do uh, look at, in the Pacific, we, we look at preventing preventing conflict and keeping that incredible stability. That, by the way, uh, the economic growth is because of the security. There are many, many factors for that security in many nations, but it's tough to have the astounding economic growth that the Pacific has had without security. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we, we've experienced that as well we, you know, uh, in, in uh, conflict. It's very frustrating. You want the growth, but you've got to have the security. And how much is enough security? We've certainly been very fortunate in the Pacific, and we want to continue to build on that. We also are unique is, uh, you know, we have the forces here at Joint Base lewis McCord in the Corps. We have also a division of about 20,000 soldiers in Hawaii. We've got a couple of brigades, about 10,000 soldiers in Alaska. And we're the only Corps that also has a forward headquarters. We have First Corps forward for uh, over a decade has been uh, in Japan. And it's also it's U.S. Army Japan and First Corps forward. And so that gives us uh, another big advantage uh, to do that partnership uh, within the Pacific and works uh, extremely well. One uh, clear-cut example of how we've rebalanced, as I mentioned, uh, when our forces come back, we still have forces in Afghanistan. When they come back, they're not going back to Afghanistan, they're going to the Pacific. And uh, they know that. And uh, it's, uh, I was talking to a young group of soldiers, uh, newcomers that just came in, uh, a whole bunch of soldiers from all over, from privates to to officers and uh, explaining the rebalance in the Pacific. And it was really neat afterwards, about a dozen of the brand new privates were waiting to talk to me. And, and they said, uh, I said, you, you know, how do you, what, what is it you want? They said, well, sir, how, how do we get to go to Thailand and Japan? And, you know, and, and they thought I could just tell them, okay, you go ahead and go. And you go. But uh, <laughs> I let them know their units are going and they're very excited about that. That's why they joined the Army, to get out and see the world and uh, to partner and to learn from other, uh, and learn other cultures. And, so they're very, very excited. And we've recently, uh, this year, we'll, we'll do seven exercises, major exercises in the Pacific. In the past, the most we've ever done is three. We just finished three major exercises. Uh, right before Christmas, we were in Japan for a major exercise for a couple weeks. We were in Korea right before that, and in Australia before that. And just amazing partnership to see. Uh, and, and I've never seen uh, morale so high from our soldiers and young leaders that this is what they joined the Army to do. And, to build that trust because, you know, you can uh, do a lot of things, but the time you, you want to build trust is not during the disaster. As I mentioned, we work with the Philippines, so it was very easy to get to the Philippines and help them. If we'd never worked with them, that'd be tough. You can't surge trust. You can surge people, but you can't surge that trust. So that's a key thing uh, for us. So uh, that's my role in this, and, uh, and I'm, I'm going to continue talking more about it, but I think that that's a good introduction of uh, of what my role and our role at uh, First Corps and here at Joint Base Lewis McCord is. So thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I don't often get the opportunity to ask questions of uh, President Young, as I'm a, I am a lowly professor at the University of Washington, <laughs> but I will uh, contain myself and stick to the script I have here. <laughs> I. Um, uh, and I have actually uh, perhaps a twofold question, uh, President Young. Uh, one uh, is uh, if you could give some examples, uh, if might be a bit too soon, but uh, how this rebalance um, has affected uh, what we do at the university, and and uh, and how this how you how this affects what you do as the president of the university. And uh, I'm also curious, uh, you have this unique position of, of being, um, being a scholar of Asia and, and having spent your academic life uh, studying this region. And perhaps you can say a few things uh, from that perspective uh, about what you think about this rebalance and uh, how significant you think uh, it is uh, uh, in this historical chapter. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think you need to go off the record just a moment because you will lose your professor credentials if you call me a scholar. Nobody ever <laughs> calls the president a scholar, but I am grateful nevertheless. Uh, the two are actually kind of related, uh, I think. Um, the, uh, at one level, the rebalance uh, will, will have a modest effect, I suspect, over time if it's reflected in other government agencies. That is to say, if you see more money coming uh, on the research front to support things with respect to uh, language instruction, um, uh, research uh, of, a, of a social, political, historical uh, uh, kind, I think you will, you know, you'll see universities shift. We have this remarkable capacity to follow money. Um, so I think you'll see, see that, in a, but I suspect that's long-term and in a modest, uh, modest way. As I think about the opportunities that the university has with what I hope is a heightened national awareness, uh, is, it, is a chance to do two or three things I think are really essential. I mean, we, we clearly need uh, much more language instruction across uh, our student population. And we fortunately are partnering with the Chinese government with the Confucius Institute, we're the only one in the nation that actually partners with the public schools, that it's a formal partnership with the public schools to teach uh, Chinese. Uh, we, we need to expand our study abroad opportunities, uh, not only in terms of the number of students who go, but I think in terms of the fields. Right now, the number of students who will choose to study in Asia tend to be a confined number of fields, and there's lots of academic reasons why that's true. As I mentioned, uh, I've made three trips to Asia over the past uh, six months, and some of the focus has been how do we structure opportunities for our students who may be in fields that have not historically spent time abroad. How can we do that in a way that's consistent with their academic agenda and the other work that they want to do? We also have been welcoming Chinese here. Uh, we have about 3,000 Chinese as students, about 1,500 of whom are undergraduate. And let me assure you, uh, if you will tell your friends, they are not replacing Washington State students. They are replacing out-of-state students. And, and uh, if you would please tell your friends that. Um, but they are an enormously valuable resource. Um, and one of our opportunities, I believe, is to figure out how to have them not only learn while they're here in the United States, but to think about how they can themselves become instructors. Uh, you introduced uh, Jeff Reedinger, our new Vice Provost for Global Affairs, who has a great deal of experience in terms of working with universities to figure out how to capture that expertise. I keep reminding people that I've lived in Japan six or seven years, but our average freshman from Japan has lived in Japan 18 years. So he or she is undoubtedly going to know more about Japan than I will ever know, and how we capture that knowledge and have them teach uh, cross-teach each other is, I think, an opportunity and important area. And we've been developing some interesting and in what I think you will see over time, some unique relationships with some foreign universities. But I would stress, one of the things I think we need to be really careful about as we think about a rebalance in Asia is that it be a balanced rebalance. Um, it's very easy to kind of um, say China is growing as rapidly as it is. It is an extraordinarily uh, rapidly growing country. We, I think, are doing <coughs> finding our way to a, to a better partnership uh, with uh, China and better cooperation. Uh, but I think we can't forget that two of the most vibrant uh, economies in Asia are, of course, Japan and Korea. Indonesia is rising rather rapidly. And we can't forget, I think, as well, that for the superficial stability that we see, Asia is a place of uh, some continual risk. and and. And if we ignore these other countries, we will, we will fail to see what that risk is. The Japan, Japanese remain very nervous. They remain nervous because largely they have seen the United States' role as a tripwire uh, in the military sense. Uh, on the other hand, we see their role as blocking up the straits with you know, letting the, whoever fights sink all those Japanese ships in the straits so nobody can get through. Neither of those are in either of our interests, and the Japanese know that. And, um, and they have a very large military. They're very nervous about uh, North Korea. They're nervous about the islands. Uh, they have all the capacity to go nuclear in a, in a nanosecond, and, and we all know that. Um, and 
the consequences of, of, of not thinking about all of these countries how, and the interplay between them, I think is serious. And we have a tendency to be able to think about only one thing at a time in America. And we really have to transcend that if we're thinking about Asia. It is not a place. It's many places with very complicated um, opportunities and challenges, very different perspectives on the world, understanding those perspectives, and trying to create, from our perspective as an academic institution, a balance to ensure that we are producing people who understand not only China, which is the low-hanging fruit right now because it's so visible and possible, but these other countries as well, because uh, we will we, we will we will not um, we will not be a positive force there unless we are capable, I think, of, of that of that kind of balance. And it and it cuts across the board. I. Uh, um, uh, I have a daughter who uh, graduated the Air Force Academy, speaks fluent Japanese, and in the middle of her time as an officer, she was designated a language officer at one point because of her capacity in Japanese, and then was told that Japanese was no longer a strategically necessary language for the Air Force. This is not wise. I mean, it really isn't. All of our institutions have to really think, I think, about that broader balance uh, with respect to Asia. Uh, and I think if we can get that right, it gives us a chance to go in in a much more cooperative, measured, intelligent way, uh, and to be a force a, a, a force for good in those partnerships when we understand their perspective and can align our interests and their interests together. Thank you very much. Um, Minister Councilor Liu, your appointment to Washington, D.C. is relatively recent, but you have a, uh, already have a long and distinguished career in uh, Foreign Service. Um, can you tell us uh, how this recent uh, rebalance in the U.S. Um, foreign policy um, affected uh, your work? Yeah. Um, well, the transfer of myself from um, European desk to uh, the United States is a huge challenge for me. Uh, it has been uh, one and a half years since I uh, came to uh, Washington, D.C. And every day I uh, try very hard to update myself uh, with the U.S. policies and with, of course, uh, our po policies towards the United States. Um, I, I still don't dare to say that I'm an uh, American uh, specialist. Right now, I probably uh, I'm, I'm still a European affairs uh, uh, specialist, but uh, I, I think uh, it's exciting for me to come to uh, this job um, as a diplomat. Uh, I think it's a must for you to come to the superpower in the world, and which uh, obviously uh, will broaden uh, your eyesight, and which, of course, uh, is good uh, for your future development. Um, but yes, uh, on Asia-Pacific rebalancing, I think we are uh, engaged uh, with the U.S. government on a daily basis on this. Uh, I, the other day, I looked at my uh, name card holder, and I found out that uh, I have already uh, made uh, perhaps 20 or 30 uh, contact person in the State Department or the White House. Um, every time, every time when we meet, we talk about uh, rebalancing. We talk about U.S.-China uh, relations and how the uh, rebalancing policy uh, would uh, have impact on this uh, very important relationship. Um, I think I feel much more confident and optimistic about our relationship uh, after all this engagement with the uh, U.S. side because I think we have more understanding with each other right now. And we do have a kind of a trust deficit in the past and it, it is still there. I mean, it takes a long time for us to cope with that. But the understanding is increasing. And we all understand that we are now intertwined with each other. 
It's just unimaginable, unimaginable for us to fight with each other because uh, our interests are at stake uh, for, I mean, further cooperations instead of uh, confrontations. So uh, if you ask my personal opinion, yes, I, uh, I'm much, much more confident. And I said that to my ambassador, uh, because he, he, was, of course, he is a specialist, an American specialist, and he know I, uh, I uh, actually did a lot of work on European affairs. And he said, well, what is your opinion about China-US relations? I said, although time is still short, but uh, I'm much more confident about that. And another example is our meal-to-meal -meal relationship. And I just talked uh, to General Brown that uh, it is becoming a bright spot in our bilateral relationship. It used to be the most difficult part of our relationship. But since last year, I mean, I think um, President Xi and President Obama played a very important uh, role in this regard to push the two sides to come closer. And we witnessed uh, much more, I mean, uh, inter exchanges between the military. Our defense minister uh, was here last year, and your defense minister is going, I think, uh, perhaps in April or sometime in the first half of this year. And we have a lot of uh, commanders, Navy commanders, Air Force commanders, coming to the States to exchange views with the U.S. side. I just told uh, General Brown that our captain of uh, the first uh, aircraft carrier came over here to, to the state, to D.C., uh, several months ago. And he had a very good uh, and frank discussions with the U U.S. side. I think that helped. His trip here helped that we avoid an uh, incident in the South China Sea in the, the other day because he did have a communications directly with the captain of the U.S. Uh, ship. And so I think we, uh, the two captains managed the incidents very well. So we avoid a kind of a confrontation there. Um, so I have much more confidence on it. I mean, so when the military has confidence, and I think as diplomats, uh, we always work for the best. We, have, we should be much more confident about our relationship. Very much. Uh, Lieutenant General Brown, you've already mentioned uh, a few of the ways in which uh, this uh, rebalance uh, started to affect your work. Um, I was wondering if you could go uh, into a little bit more detail and give some examples. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, well, you know, I think the most important is uh, the whole of government approach is critical. And uh, again, some of the things we've learned in the past few years. Uh, we, we call it the gym environment. You know, the military has to have an acronym uh, for everything. But for us, it's joint. We, we're going to, again, all the services are needed. Uh, interagency, critical. Uh, uh, intergovernmental, critical. Uh, and multinational. You know, and and uh, I can't foresee any incident happening where the, the United States wouldn't want to go in the, the gym environment. You know, we don't want to do things alone. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's critical, uh, like before we do anything uh, in the Pacific, of course, we're checking with the Department of State and working through the country teams and the ambassador and, and coordinate, coordinating these type of events. And uh, three main things that, as you look at the rebalance, uh, major elements to it is you know, strengthening relationships, probably the most important. As Mr. Council Leo mentioned, you know, there, there is a bond. Military, uh, militaries have things in common across the world and, and it's it's very it is very easy military to military to get a relationship going and start to build that trust and uh, it's it's really important in my experience uh, I've been fortunate to uh, visit China several times and then host many of those visitors a lot of army visitors as well to uh, to the United States and I find that uh, it, it's a fascinating experience and you you start kind of everybody's walking on eggshells and then by the end you're you're very close and uh, uh, you have so much in common you didn't realize and that's what it's all about building that trust I mentioned earlier another major element uh, of the rebalance is what we've talked a little bit about adjusting our military posture and presence so that we can do that partnership because quite honestly like over the last 12 years we have first Corps hasn't been able to do it because we've been engaged elsewhere so adjusting that posture 
uh, is key. And finally, for us, a major element of the rebalance is employing new concepts, uh, capabilities, and capacities uh, that will help us build that trust even better and, and uh, help us uh, uh, build those relationships and be prepared for anything that may happen. It's a wide spectrum of what may happen, again, most likely being a, disa a disaster, unfortunately, because of uh, how the Pacific is uh, situated. And uh, we, we know there's going to be a disaster. I wish we'd say there weren't going to be, but, but there are. I also uh, thought it would be important, you know, uh, usually when people look at the Pacific, they think Navy because there's so much blue, and the Navy is critical in the Pacific. Man, all the services are extremely important. But when you look at the Army's role, there's a lot of blue. But I always remind my Navy brothers that the, uh, uh, the people live on the land. Okay, and so there's a lot of blue, but, but there's folks on the land. And, uh, and, and then six of the ten largest armies in the world are in the Pacific. Six of the ten. Uh, and uh, of the 27 nations that have militaries in the Pacific, 26 of those nations, the Army's the biggest service. Most of them by far. Some of them kind of have, you know, sort of are trying to get a, an Air Force and a Navy, but 26 of them, the Army's the largest service. And then of their lead, their, their chairman of the Joint Chiefs equivalent, their senior military man, 21 of the 27 are Army officers. So it doesn't mean that only the Army can engage, but it certainly means Army to Army, you've got a lot more in common. And you can get started and, and then open the door for those relationships across the whole spectrum uh, and, and, and building that trust and all the services can be involved. So it's, it's, it's really uh, critical. And uh, I think uh, another thing that happened to me, I came in and, uh, okay, well, where's the focus in the Pacific? Well, the logical focus for us was with our five treaty partners uh, in the Pacific right from the beginning. There are treaty partners and, you know, that's uh, Australia, Japan, Korea, Thailand and the Philippines. We have treaties with those five nations. Now, uh, as uh, you know, uh, uh, our, our uh, uh, leadership has stated, it's not only about those five treaty nations, though. Now we've got to go out and look. We, we want the uh, uh, security and prosperity for all nations in the Pacific. So we've got to extend beyond those treaty nations and, and reach out and try to develop those relationships with all, uh, you know, all the nations. And uh, the new relationships are absolutely critical. And again, you have to have the presence uh, to do that. And mill to mill is a great starting point. It's not to be all end all and we need all the whole of government uh, is critical, uh, but security, uh, as mentioned earlier, is absolutely key to that economic prosperity. And uh, I know one thing I've seen and witnessed, if you don't have the security, it's very tough to have the prosperity. Uh, impossible, really, I would say. Uh, and so you have to have uh, the, uh, the capability. We want to do, and I'm very excited about doing more with China. Uh, because again, you build that trust, and in my experience, and I've been fortunate enough to do a lot of those exchanges, and it's, it's just terrific to see. Uh, it, it, the difficult part for all the military folks uh, is uh, that it is a whole government approach, and we, we work for civilian leadership, and sometimes if something goes wrong, they can say, okay, stop the mill to mill. And so we're going along great glide path, things are looking good, and then you come to a screeching halt. And I've seen that over the last uh, 15, 20 years. I, I think we'll see that less now because of the, the, the great exchanges the minister mentioned. And I think we'll see that less. I'm hoping we'll see that less because I think the most important thing you can do is, is uh, get together. The more you learn about each other, the more you trust, and the less likely for some uh, error to occur because, you know, perceptions. And, uh, and that's uh, really a, uh, a key to success in uh, what we're calling the rebounds. Thank you. Um, I have uh, two more questions to the panelists, and uh, after uh, getting their answers, uh, we will open it to the audience uh, for your questions and comments. Um, the second question, next question is, uh, is about the introduction of this policy. Uh, there is a sense sometimes uh, that it was introduced or it was perceived as being introduced primarily in a military-focused way. Um, so uh, in the past, uh, major changes U.S. foreign policy was always accompanied by uh, other uh, developments, uh, big investments in education, um, area studies programs and languages, etc. Uh, President Young, do you see now or do you hope for a similar kind of increase 
uh, in uh, education-related expenses in the U.S. government uh, that will support uh, this rebalance? Um, I'm always optimistic that the government <clears throat> will do the right thing and, of course, always disappointed, but <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always optimistic they will do it. But look, I, I think that's a really good cautionary note. I mean, I, I really appreciate what the general says in terms of the military being kind of the spear that goes in, not in a military sense, but they're the first ones there because they're the most effectively organized. And but also, um, <clears throat> comparatively speaking, um, resources. I think we will know about the legitimacy of the rebalance when we watch the budget. Let me just give you an example. I, I had the opportunity uh, a couple of nights ago to have dinner with uh, General uh, Sorelli, who was the, uh, our commander in Iraq uh, <clears throat> for a couple of years. And he said something very interesting to me. He said, uh, he said to all of us actually, uh, he said, when they were in Iraq, if they had been able to go in and provide water to a community, and sewage removal and so forth, they, had, they did not fight any battles there. They only occurred where they were not able to go in and provide those really basic resources. He said it was 100% true. Then he said, the, pro we, we, the natural question is, well, why didn't you do that? He said, well, one example, he said, we had $100 million we could use for a particular um, water restoration program and so forth. He said the problem was uh, that we, we were told to stop because we were violating the federal procurement regulations. Uh, and then he said, other examples, when they came in and first uh, in the green zone decided they were going to do something infrastructure supportive and very quickly got in there and they built the sewage plant and he said they cut the ribbon on the sewage plant. Nobody figured out how to get the sewage to the plant. Nobody had really thought about, about that. The reason I raise that is at the exact same time that was going on, we were cutting AID's budget in more than half. Um, and as the general said, he was sitting there and testifying in front of his committees and talking about a billion dollars here and a billion dollars there. The State Department people would go in and talk about money and they would say, you're going to spend $3 million on that program? I mean, that was the difference. So I think one of the questions, how serious we are about this, if we really do think this is a rebalance that is long-term, that is going to create all of the potential understanding and infrastructure and so forth necessary, follow the budget and we'll see how serious we are about it. I'm, 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 um, I, I wish I were more optimistic, but I, I think we'll see how serious we are by what we do, by wh what, where the money goes. And if, the, if we don't see any substantial shift in those resources with AID, Department of State, Department of Education, uh, and so forth, uh, I think, I, I think this, this, this will be a modest shift at best in U.S. policy. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Counselor, you, uh, let me ask you uh, the same question from a slightly different perspective. Uh, we all know that, of course, uh, Asia and China has always been important for U.S. Um, what was your uh, reaction to the launching of this introduction of this policy? Were you surprised? Uh, was it uh, clear to you what the um, impetus was behind it? Uh, do you have any comments on that? Um, I don't know whether I'm in a good position to common uh, uh, the, the introduction of this uh, rebalancing policy. But uh, I don't think it's a surprise for us. And it's just, as I just said, that uh, it's a kind of a natural outcome uh, for the United States to review itself and to look at the whole world, what is going on. Um, it, it, I think it's a natural um, uh, process. The, the problem now is that, uh, and I, under, I understand the U.S. now is trying to make it a comprehensive one. Um, as President Young said, the education factor is also very important. Um, we now have almost uh, 230,000 Chinese students uh, studying uh, in the United States. And the student, the number of the students are 
the United States in China has been increasing, uh, reaching a new level of, uh, I was told the other day that it's uh, 68,000. Of course, it's not still not a comparison, but uh, that's a, a record high for the United States. And in the years ahead, I believe that the uh, two governments have uh, made up their mind to further increase the uh, exchanges uh, between students and, of course, the uh, uh, cultural ex exchanges as well. Um, I think last year, in November, we just uh, concluded a new round of uh, cultural dialogue uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was uh, jointly uh, uh, chaired by uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and on the Chinese side, uh, Vice Premier uh, Liu Yandong, uh, uh, the only female in the uh, public bureau. So she's an important uh, person. And I think um, the conclusion drawn up by this uh, dialogue is that if we want to make this relationship right in a long-term perspective, we have to have more educational exchanges uh, which plays a long-term role and which uh, I think um, is fundamentally important for us because uh, when the people to people uh, have uh, more feelings of uh, closeness, I think the uh, government will, of course, uh, uh, accommodate to uh, the request of, of the people. So I, I do believe that the cultural factors, education uh, factors, and tourism as well uh, can all play a very important in this regard. Um, uh, I happened to watch uh, a TV, uh, sorry, a movie uh, uh, produced by China uh, very recently, uh, which is named uh, When Beijing Meets Seattle. I don't know how many of you uh, in this room have uh, watched that. Uh, uh, it was a love story about a lady uh, coming from Beijing uh, and meeting with a, a gentleman, a Chinese gentleman, of course, here, uh, who live in, in Seattle. Um, I think this uh, movie uh, was a kind of uh, trying to model on uh, the movie of uh, Seattle, The, the Sleepless. Um, so, I mean, the significance of this uh, Chinese movie, uh, I mean, both movies, is that there are much more Chinese uh, tourists coming to Seattle, and hopefully they will come uh, to this town, uh, Tacoma, which is not uh, far away from Seattle. So uh, I think this is a very good phenomenon. Uh, um, so long as people, I mean, have more understanding with each other, I'm confident that uh, the government, uh, it will be much easier for the government to, uh, to, to work together to have a better relationship. Thank you. Then General Brown. Thanks. Well, I can see a sequel to the one China meets Seattle already, sleepless in Beijing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, sometimes uh, the job, I want to, I think the president had a great point. You know, sometimes the job is not a uh, military job. Uh, and in my career, I've, you know, we talk about how's your experience shape your, uh, what you're doing. You know, I, I've uh, been involved in Haiti, where really it, it wasn't a military job, uh, but we were the only ones that had the transportation, the organization, and the the structure, the speed to get there and help folks, uh, you know, save lives. But most important, we had the incredible uh, agile leaders, you know, who can solve a complex problem in a timely manner. Uh, and and uh, I'm just really proud. That's what our military and, and many of the corporations that Minister Council Leo mentioned are recognizing that and hiring our veterans, uh, scarfing them up uh, uh, quickly because they know that the type of leadership they learn, but I've seen it in Haiti, I've seen it in Bosnia, uh, and in Iraq. I spent more time my second tour in Iraq helping develop rule of law, uh, show them what it's like to be in a democracy and rebuild structure and uh, negotiations between uh, you know, Kurds and Arabs in, in many cases. Spent more time doing that than uh, any of the traditional military tasks. And, uh, uh, now, would we like to start, uh, you know, in my experience, I saw, you know, when I first went into Iraq, we, we didn't have the State Department right there with us, and 
uh, later, uh, they were right there and uh, went to every meeting, and, every, and that was much better. And I think a lot of us wouldn't have had multiple tours had we, from the beginning, uh, done that interagency, intergovernmental, and I mentioned in the beginning. So it's, it, it's, it's very uh, important. Uh, we, we are not often, uh, the military is not out there saying, please send us, please send us, but we're the only option sometimes if you want to get there, be organized, save lives, et cetera. So uh, we have to be uh, you know, cognizant of that. Now, for the resources, that is a challenge. Uh, we're, we're facing it with sequestration. Uh, we're, we're fortunate, and you can see the rebalance already uh, taking effect. As many of my friends who are commanding other places in Europe and other regions are cutting exercises uh, quite a bit. And uh, we're reducing the participation, but not cutting the exercises. So, you know, for example, uh, you know, we were supposed to send a couple thousand people on exercise to Korea. Well, we sent a couple hundred. The rest, uh, you know, we tried to do it by simulation and link them in as efficiently as possible. But it's just not the same, you know. But, but we're still doing the exercise. So that, I'm not complaining because others are cutting and not doing exercises at all. Significantly in Europe, for example, cutting the exercises. Uh, I was in NATO in 2010 and uh, saw those starting to really reduce significantly. Um, I think it's also uh, important, uh, you know, uh, my experience when I was a younger officer uh, many, many years ago, back when there was still uh, horse cavalry and things like that, uh, but, uh, but we saw uh, bilateral was the only way in the Pacific. And I can remember as a captain on the uh, U.S. Army Pacific staff mentioning, you know, why don't we do more multilateral stuff? And they looked at me like I was crazy, you know, and uh, well, that'll never happen. Well, now we see multilaterals happen, and uh, it's happening with you know, APEC, and it's happening. I've, I just uh, got to participate in the first trilateral Australia, U.S., Japan, uh, military to military talks. Uh, it was very exciting uh, about six months ago, and we're seeing much more uh, multilateral, and everybody is, and it goes back to what everybody has mentioned here. You've got to make sure everybody's involved. You can't have the haves and the have-nots. Uh, you have to make sure that everybody has a chance for this prosperity. Uh, and uh, again, for us, uh, sometimes would we rather sometimes have uh, other folks lead that? With, yes, maybe, but we're the ones capable of doing it, organized to do it, and in some cases with the resources, which is a great point. I, uh, I'm a big believer we need many more resources in USAID and Department of State because uh, I've seen what they can do and I've seen when they're reduced uh, the effects. So I, I think we need to look at that. But, uh, but, but definitely, uh, the final thing I'll say from experience is uh, sometimes as an army, we were a little bit too cumbersome when we'd go somewhere. We'd, we'd send this huge force. So we've learned and we've uh, actually were very tailorable, scalable, and we can send from 20 folks if needed. At the Philippines, for example, we sent about 30 folks. That were, and that's all that was needed. We didn't need 300, 400, 500. We just needed 30 experts to help get the planes in, get the logistics supplies out, get water to people, uh, medical to help people, uh, and uh, uh, those key uh, things that, that they didn't have there to save lives, you know. So it was very easy, and so as few as possible. So we're very scalable, and we didn't used to do that. We kind of had to take a huge chunk, a thousand people, and that was about it. But now we're, we're uh, really working on uh, tailorable, scalable, and uh, how do we uh, only provide what's needed but make sure we're ready if it's the, the high-end worst case, you know. If, North Korea decides to do something stupid, we've got to be ready. The nation's going to ask us to go fight that war. But at the same time, the most likely thing to happen is disaster response. We have to be ready for that. We have to be able to scale for that and do what we can. And then, oh, by the way, get the heck out of there. Like in the case of the Philippines, we were there and helped. And as soon as we could, we got out of there and let many of the non-governmental organizations and all the other folks who do such an amazing job uh, do what they do best. Uh, but we were just able to get there first. Thank you. Um, we do also, uh, we would like to uh, have our panelists to kind of look a little bit uh, into the future and reflect on the, uh, uh, the, the challenges that are with us now and that are likely to arise as we move forward. Um, but uh, I think what I'd like to do is uh, to save that to the end and open this now to the uh, audience. And I'd like to invite you uh, to come up to the microphone uh, if you have questions. Uh, you can direct your questions to an individual panelist or to all of them. But please make them questions, and then we would like to include as many of you as possible. Please. Thank you very much, sir. It's wonderful to get to have this opportunity to ask. 
Uh, the microphones uh, just didn't have it high enough. <laughs> Primarily for Minister Liu, uh, but I would like to hear General Brown's thoughts on this particularly. Our great strength, particularly in this venue, is the civil-military relationship that we share in this country. And without going into background and, and detail, one of the key strategic missing points in our successful engagement between Americans and Chinese is that in China, the People's Liberation Army is in relative isolation. And it must be able to speak, even within its own country, with its people, and with us. I wonder, what can state and city level leaders, not just the national level, where things are clearly happening on a great thing. I was so glad to hear the mill mill comments and the observations you've had recently. But they're just points. What can we do in our leadership when we engage with our Chinese counterparts to help encourage in China the opening up of the PLA that we might engage them in this dialogue also? Uh, thank you. I think it's a good question. Um, for China to open up, it, it's just about 35 years. So I always say that, uh, well, China is uh, both old and young. Old in terms of its uh, long history and civilization, but young, we actually just uh, adopted the uh, opening up and reform policy 35 years ago. So you can also say China is only 35 years old, uh, much younger than the United States in this sense. Um, so, I mean, we are still in a process in a transformation of opening up. It used to be a very uh, close society. I mean, people were very curious, curious about uh, this country. Perhaps people still have this uh, kind of a feeling on North Korea, but China is, I mean, much more different uh, from North Korea, I mean. Um, so as far as the military uh, relations with uh, I mean, the society, I think it goes together with the pace of the opening up of the whole society. Um, it's, I think it's fair uh, to say that uh, military perhaps uh, is the uh, most uh, secretive part of uh, the society. Well, um, it has its own reasons uh, for, I mean, the uh, unique, uh, 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 I mean, re it has its own unique re reasons. But I think um, if you put it in a context, I should say uh, the PLA is much more open now. Um, it has its own spokesperson in the Defense Department. I mean, when I was in the Foreign Ministry uh, acting as the uh, spokesman there, one of the uh, headache for me is that they didn't have the spokesman, so every question was posed to me. And I wanted to refer it to our uh, military colleagues, but uh, I have nowhere to refer them. But now, I mean, since last year, uh, they had the uh, uh, spokesman system, and they do regular uh, press conference. I think it's uh, two eyes a uh, month. Uh, is still not enough. We in the foreign ministry, we do daily press conference there. So uh, we still push them to do more. But I think that shows uh, their willingness to open up. And they've got a website now. I don't know whether they have an English website or not, but at least a Chinese one. Uh, but, uh, but luckily, uh, there are more and more people uh, in the world who can speak Mandarin. Um, but again, this shows uh, the signs, at least, of their opening up. And they have much more, they are conducting much more dialogue with uh, 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 the military of other countries, including the United States. And there are much more uh, joint military drills between PLA and, and, and foreign uh, militaries. Uh, so I think it's a process, it's a process. And one of the uh, strong advantages of uh, Chinese is that once we realize the benefits 
of opening up, we are very quick. Sometimes uh, uh, you are surprised by our, I mean, rhythm or by our pace. So when it comes to the military, it's the same. And I, I think uh, uh, the military uh, ought to uh, open its door uh, to uh, the society. And there is much more dialogue, I should say, uh, between the military and uh, and the society. And I mean, we, we are coming closer to the Spring Festival. So every time on this occasion is a big uh, opportunity, and it's a big occasion for the military to engage uh, the uh, civilian people in a, in, 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 in a country. And uh, I'd like to just, uh, just a brief example of that. Uh, I was uh, the executive assistant to the PACOM Pacific Command Commander, Admiral Fallon, a four-star uh, admiral, in 2006. And, uh, you know, if there was an economic issue, very quickly it could be handled. You know, there's an economic issue, or you could be there the next day. Uh, for a visit, uh, Admiral Fallon was going to visit uh, China, and we had had uh, senior Chinese uh, officers visit uh, the United States, and we showed them some pretty, uh, you know, high-level capabilities. And so, in this visit, we were looking for reciprocity. You know, we showed you some good stuff. Can you show us some good stuff? You know, kind of building that relationship. And I worked this for six months. I worked this trip, and uh, we wanted to see the latest uh, jet fighter and we wanted to go on the border of North Korea. And uh, we had, you know, back and forth, back and forth, and we actually got on the plane for the trip, not knowing what our itinerary was. Now, for a four-star admiral, that's unheard of. You know, they, they will go visit somewhere. It's known well in advance, every minute of their time, what they're going to see. Uh, we landed, and uh, thankfully, I got to keep my job because we got to go see the fighter, and we got to go on the border of North Korea. Uh, but this was in 2006. But, you know, I saw the exa exactly what Minister Council Leo was talking about. Uh, it, the military wanted to answer us, but there was one small approval process they had to wait for, and it went all the way up this process. They wanted answers, but they couldn't. It was, I would consider it a lack of trust. It, you know, I don't know that, but I would just consider it must have been something, you know, it just took, seemed like it took entirely too long. Uh, later, much faster, and I think, uh, again, just from my experience, you can see that, you know, the, the militaries came up for us. We had things in our system. There's no question of civilian leadership from the very beginning of things like Paso Comitatus and all these things that, that put us in that direction. We have to have that civilian leadership, and it's just very natural. And as, as their society changes, you can see that the trust is growing, and they'll move towards that, but uh, they're just not where we were. It's different background. and and uh, different concerns with the military. So it, it's very, it seems very logical to us, but they're much, much more of it. Just had, the, as I mentioned earlier, the highest ranking Chinese general visit when I was commanding Fort Benning a couple years ago. Extremely open dialogue, great discussions, uh, like night and day from what I saw in 2006. So, and then uh, RIMPAC is a major naval exercise, the largest one in the Pacific, and China will be in it this year which is really neat. And uh, we're inviting to, uh, China has come and observed many of our uh, army exercises uh, in Thailand and many other places. And uh, we're encouraging that. We want participation. And, uh, uh, and, and again, it's for all the services as well. So uh, I see it uh, growing, getting better. That's a great question. Thanks. Uh, Minister Liu, could you talk to the uh, friction points in the South China Sea and around the Senkaku Islands, and I apologize for using the Japanese name, uh, it's one of those things that causes, let's call it apprehension in the United States, and certainly with the Philippines. I have a friend who travels there regularly, and he said that the Philippine press was full of an uproar over some fracas over the Scarborough Shoal off of the Philippines. It's a friction point that the U.S. and China ought to be able to... Uh, help settle down, and I wonder what your thoughts are on that, sir. Uh, thank you for the question. And first of all, uh, if, if you just know uh, the uh, names in Japanese, I can teach you uh, the names in Chinese. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <if you> want. <laughs> and also the uh, Scabaro uh, in Chinese. Uh, it's, it's easy for me. But uh, yeah, I, I think... Um, Yes, uh, this is a uh, good question, I should say. Um, 
Let me just put it very simple. Uh, on both these uh, issues, East China Sea and both uh, and South China Sea, uh, China did not start. I mean, the uh, crisis there. We just reacted to it. So I think um, people should realize that it's, it was just because of the uh, nationalization or the purchasing of of the Japanese government of uh, Dawi Islands, which I mean brought about the uh, souring of uh, our bilateral relationship, which is which is unfortunate. We we don't want to see, I mean, uh, Sino-Japanese relations deteriorate to such a low level. I think it perhaps it 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 is now the lowest level since uh, the uh, uh, diplomatic relations. Uh, were established in 1972. It was unfortunate for us, for as a diplomat, I mean, we always work for the best. We were very frustrated by the uh, setback between our uh, two countries. But I think um, China should not uh, take up, I mean, the uh, responsibility. It was the other side who started uh, the Provocation. And it's the same uh, with uh, uh, Huang Yan Island, uh, Skabaru. Um, it was just because of the, uh, <coughs> the uh, harassment of uh, Philippines' worship of Chinese fishermen in that area, which uh, brought about the uh, incident there. So as a government, you have to respond to that. But of course, we are, uh, as a principle, we are still want to see, I mean, the uh, relations between China and Japan, China and the Philippines coming back on the right track. And we still believe that the only way to get the relationship right is by diplomacy, talking and negotiations. So, I mean, uh, our doors are open for negotiations. Uh, we understand, of course, uh, each side has its own concern. Uh, well, that's the fact, right? Uh, we do not deny that. But it's important that uh, we sit down and talk and try uh, to address those concerns. Because uh, I don't believe uh, people would fight uh, for a few rocks or the, the, the blue water. Uh, right? <laughs> That's, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the worst scenario that uh, we would have seen. So um, for us, it's very clear. Uh, we have to react to protect our sovereignty. We have a bottom line here, right? Uh, as a big country, we don't want to bully small country. But vice versa, big countries should not be bullied by small, uh, small, small countries, right? Um, sometimes I, I could not help uh, uh, how the U.S. our U.S. colleagues will react to this kind of uh, uh, behavior. Um, if, if I'm wrong, please uh, correct me. Um, perhaps uh, I mean, your worships uh, would have already been said there, uh, either as a kind of a deterrent or as a last resort. Uh, all tables are on the, on the table. It's, uh, uh, a U.S. Uh, I mean, problem, or a belief. But for us, uh, the only way to get through these kind of difficulties is by, I mean, negotiations and, and talk. I'm going to take us down on that hot topic. And as I look at the map in front of us, I've had the extreme privilege of traveling to every one of those dots except the Eastern Russian places. So I'm your tourist, um, and I'm concerned about all the people in all those places because they all want the same thing, a decent opportunity for their children and their families and their faith and their life. But I've not heard a single word about India. Is that not considered Asia? There are a lot of smart people there, and they are booming, and they're getting big middle class, and lucky for me as a tourist, they speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I think this is a good comment. I don't know if you want to comment on this, but maybe. Yeah, I, I would uh, start by saying it wasn't on purpose, uh, not mentioning India. Uh, clearly, we are doing more with India than we ever had, had in the past. Uh, we had, for example, uh, first time ever striker battalion go to India and participate with their army and events. And we, we do quite a bit um, uh, with India and it, it is extremely important. Uh, it's one of the challenges, you know, uh, Pacific is 52% of the Earth's surface and uh, the countries are not right next to each other. It's definitely a challenge, the tyranny of distance. Uh, but. Uh, we, we look to engage India as much as possible, and, uh, uh, but I, I think when I say, you know, five treaty partners are the, the primary for exercise and so forth, but then there are, we do, for example, uh, trying to, I was an exercise director for Pacific Command, and I know of at least 10 exercises all the services do in India, and a lot of exchanges, uh, so it is very important, and that's a great point. Uh, I wasn't on purpose, we didn't mention it. Uh, there's a bunch of other countries we didn't mention either that might be upset. <laughs> but uh, no, we're definitely involved. We'll I, I will make one comment, though, that uh, my experience, similar frustration in India to some other countries where mill to mill, I think we could go very far, but sometimes you're, you know, obviously, you, you get your guides and you're slow. And, and for us, mostly in India, we're slowed down by the Indian government. They uh, will very cautious and seem to move extremely slow, you know, again, from military, we move pretty fast and want to make things happen. There's many other countries where that happens where, you know, of course, we're not going to do something if it's not all the government approach or the State Department and everybody doesn't approve it. Uh, in India, we do get slowed down quite a bit. We'll take that as a friendly suggestion for your next panel. Please. Thank you, Dr. Hot Topic. If I could uh, ask uh, could I get General Brown to begin this? What I'm interested in is knowing, with this the rebalancing, taking the Japanese-Chinese relationship here, this difficult, how does the rebalance, how does the military, how can the military respond and help that relationship end? And then I last, Minister Council of Lou and President Kennel, does that make sense? <coughs> Do this? No, thanks. Uh, and I'd be happy to, as I mentioned, we just finished a major exercise in Japan, Yamasakura. This was the 65th of those. I've been in several of them. Uh, I will say it's amazing to see the change. When I was a younger officer a few years ago, uh, you know, the Japanese Ground Self-Defense Force was in one location. We were in another, the U.S. Uh, Army in this case, and we talked back and forth. This exercise, here we all, all, we're in a huge headquarters, bigger than this room, and there was Japanese ground self-defense force soldier, U.S., Japanese, U.S., were side by side, truly bilateral, very interesting. I was partnered with a three-star uh, Japanese uh, general, and uh, I can tell you that we, we talked about the relationship with China, so we, you know, it took me a while, we, we worked together and, and built a trust by the end of the exercise, we're friends for life now, and, and there were many discussions on uh, relationships and what what I expressed over and over again the same thing Mr. Councilor Leo that you know it's about relationships and getting to know folks and building that trust and uh, discussions diplomacy and talking through these issues is the only way to handle it uh, no one wants to escalate and, and we, we had a lot of discussions like that and it, it didn't start that way we, you know we, uh, we, we would have talked that at the beginning because we got to know each other better so I go back to military military relationships are critical you have things in common all militaries throughout the world. You know, the same jokes about basic training, the same you know, things about a uniform and all the, you know, the, like the readers don't just uh, uh, humor and uniform, you know, it's the same just about the army anywhere. And you, you, you start to learn about each other as, as people with families and you just, you're discussing issues. And that's our best chance uh, as we, you know, we had another exercise in Korea before that for two weeks. It's the first time ever uh, that a U.S. Corps has worked for a Korean four-star commander, and everybody's very concerned about that. It, it was fantastic. We had a Canadian division. General Turan, by the way, he's my deputy. He wasn't mentioned. He's Canadian. So we have a Canadian deputy in First Corps, which makes us multinational right from the beginning. Uh, I told him, I used to joke with him, the only reason we had Canada in the exercise was to blame Canada if things went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but in reality, Canada in the exercise saved the day. They were fantastic. They were wonderful. Uh, and so we had Canadian Division, we had uh, U.S. Division, about 20,000 soldiers, and then we had two uh, 
Korean divisions uh, and then working for a Korean four star. Again, same thing, starting out, not really knowing each other, but building that trust. And by the end, we also had discussions on South China Sea and these type of issues. Uh, so I, I just see that that's where, you know, by getting to know each other and doing more mill to mill and more whole of government approach, the better we get to know each other, the better we'll resolve these problems. And the suspicion when you don't know each other and trying to guess what the other side's doing is the worst thing that can happen. The better you get to know each other, the better it's going to be resolved. And the final thing I'll say about this hot topic is I had the privilege to be at a, a Pacific Leader Seminar with general officers from some 30 Pacific nations last year for a few days at the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies. And uh, the only topic that brought up uh, any tension was the South China Sea. And it was a, a general from China, a general from Vietnam, a general from the Philippines, a general from, and everything, we got along very well the whole time, we got to know each other, and then the last day they brought up this topic, and I uh, wish they had, because it's just, you know, everybody felt like they had to make a statement on it, and it was just fascinating to watch, and uh, it's a difference, and we got to work through it, but I do feel like we got closer to getting to know each other, those of us there got closer for sure, uh, uh, hopefully to talk and a solution. So what I would like to do, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take, uh, of the four people now, there are only two. <laughs> if you could each ask your questions briefly, and then I will ask each panelist both to respond and, and perhaps say a few concluding uh, uh, remarks, because uh, we're coming to the end of our time. Please. Uh, yes, uh, I want to introduce a new topic. That's the digital revolution. And it strikes me that there is going to be no long-term imbalance in the Pacific, uh, unless you cope with a rapidly changing digital world. It redefines security. Uh, it redefines education in the most fundamental way. And I wonder if, uh, when I was recently in China, actually hosted by the Central Committee, I was asked to write a paper on how to manage a network society, I refused. Uh, now, my question is, uh, for each of you, would you offer a few comments on how you plan a long-term balance in the city and how it relates to the digital revolution? Uh, I'd be happy to start. For Oh, we'll sorry. Take all the questions. Oh, take all the questions. Okay, got it. Sir, the question I have been looking at and would be interested in input from each of you would be uh, the when it comes to crisis situation, uh, a number of things have happened in China. There's serious earthquakes that have taken place, a lot of damage and a lot of death. I know that two. Um, both, uh, both armies have actually worked together to go ahead. And uh, I know the United States Army was working with the Chinese Army about finding uh, uh, techniques and finding uh, people buried in rubble, etc. Is there a possibility for more work between the two governments and a possibility that there would be um, that America or the United States Army Navy would be allowed or permitted in China to actually help with one of those crisis situations? Question is a two-part question. I was thinking about this question for a few weeks now. Um, but what do you think is in the best interest of having a united Korean peninsula? My, uh, my question is for all three of you. What advice can you give for prospective students who are looking to move into leadership roles and the change of political uh, sphere? The last one. Yeah. This is for Council Leo and maybe everyone on the panel here. But just as of yesterday, it was reported that by UN climate chief Christiana Figueres that global investments in cleaner energy and more sustainable economies have not been made on a global scale. And how, um, what kind of influence do you think these new emerging markets that have big economic prosperity thanks to the security provided by uh, General Brown? military forces around the world, um, what kind of influences do you see having to make those economic and cultural shifts? 
in the colonies and communities? Great. These are terrific questions, both in terms of summing up our discussion, but also uh, leading us into really uh, important directions uh, into the future. So, uh, President again. Uh, the answer is yes, no, no, yes. <laughs> I, I think a lot of questions have been raised. Let me, uh, let me just sort of briefly touch on a little of them because I think they relate in a certain way. Um, what can the military do with respect to, to China, Japan, et cetera, et cetera? I, I want to go up to a, not even a 30,000, maybe a 60,000 foot level. Make, it, make an observation for what it's worth. Um, ambiguity. If you, think, if you think about what forced China and Taiwan to talk to each other. So neither was quite sure what we would do. And I remember when I was in the State Department, Secretary Baker made this strong statement of support for Taiwan. The entire House of Cards came down and it took about a year to rebalance and say, no, no, we're not sure what we would do. Which, which kept Taiwan uncertain, kept China uncertain, and they talked to each other. So a certain level, of it, we've talked an awful lot about the military today. The backdrop of that, of course, is that um, that creates a certain kind of stability and disaster relief, and that's all important. But at the end of the day, to, these problems really have to be solved at a, at a profound level at the diplomatic level. Minister Liu is absolutely right. Military has an important role. Part of that role is to preserve that stability. I would not discount the value of ambiguity in, in, in what we do there. Um, related to that, I think, is a real appreciation um, and this relates to a couple of these other issues, a real appreciation for the fact that, I, mean, I was listening to the President of Iran talk about this uh, agreement that we've reached, and he talked about areas in which we agree, and areas in which we will manage our disagreements. And it's important for us to understand that um, much of our relationship, we do have different perspectives. I remember a young student talking to me one time about a group of, uh, she had studied Russia in uh, the United States, and from a very cranky Russian dissident. They, he took his class over to Russia and they met with a group of Russian students. And she said she was really surprised because they thought as Americans that they would be able to say, you know, it's terrible. The human rights record is really disastrous. Don't you want better human rights? The Russian students responded and said, well, yeah, yeah, that's all okay. But what we really admire about what President Putin is doing is putting Russia back in its rightful place in the world. Um, in, 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 in the world. And all of a sudden, these students, it just dawned on them that there was no disagreement about Russia's human rights record. There was a difference in value of that. We have to understand, I think, that an awful lot of what we talk about in the circumstances is not a question of, of understanding leading to agreement. It's a difference between understanding and agreement, and I think that becomes important. From that perspective, Tom, I think the digital revolution will be enormously powerful in enhancing our understanding and confusing this. I think it will be masterful to do it in both of those. Um, a lot will turn on um, how we find ways to create credibility on the information. One of the problems now, if you, if you read blogs, um, some really interesting information, and then there's a whole community of people with tinfoil hats on who are writing utter and extraordinary nonsense. And we, we have lost a lot of our filter. And I think one role universities can play in this is, a much, is, is, is to work to try and create values where you can really have a dialogue where there, there is at least some credibility, uh, at least in the factual assertions that go on and let people work their own opinions out of that. But I think, that, I, I think we are going to see um, that. I think we're going to see much less uh, control. But an interesting book uh, by uh, Moses Naive, that many of you may have read, called The Eden Power, talking about how the digital revolution um, disperses power in a pretty dramatic way. Every country is going to have to deal with that, and our policies, I think, are going to have to deal with that uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, a united Korean uh, uh, peninsula, um, I, I, am, I spend, have spent a lot of years working on human rights related like issues. It is, it, is, um, it is the single most appalling country in the world, without any question. Um, and uh, 
uh, who I can go with a great litany as, as to as to the consequences that's had on the people. Um, I had the opportunity while I was at the State Department to work on as the lawyer for the U.S. delegation to negotiate the German unification and went back to academics and then was asked to sort of do a comparison between German and the potential for the Korean unification. Uh, it is uh, it, it is going to be uh, spectacular in its complexity, and it's going to change not only the, the, the peninsula and the economic and the social consequences of it will be extraordinary, but in addition, you're going to have significant geopolitical shifts that occur when that happens because of the political viability of American presence and where that presence is and is not uh, optimal, and what will then happen um, in, as other countries react to those shifts in American posture? And so I think we're going to—I think Korean unification, uh, uh, were it to occur, uh, has a tremendous uh, benefit from taking tens of millions of people who are in the worst circumstances you could possibly imagine and, and giving them the potential for some life. But it, it, it is going to be horrifically expensive. Uh, the consequences geopolitically will be very complicated. And if you talk about a management issue in Asia, that is a touch point for extraordinary management uh, management issues. Um, students, what students should do, uh, study an Asian language. Uh, I, I understand that we are, we are blessed with our Chinese counterparts uh, and many Asians speaking very, very good English, but a language is a window in, into something well beyond the mere words that are being used. And I think I, I, uh, it's not an end in itself, it's a tool, but it's a powerful tool to a certain kind of insight and capacity to be in these areas. And I would warmly encourage, uh, we're going to require all of our administrators at the University of Washington to speak Chinese. But, <laughs> <laughs> but this, this, I think, is, uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is absolutely, uh, absolutely critical. I will just finally conclude with um, an optimistic note. I don't know whether I'm an optimistic or pessimistic. I'm fundamentally optimistic because I, I see so many landmines. If you see it, you may know where to not set one. But um, one of the things that has really excited me in dealing with Asia over a lot of years, and you see it increasing even today, and that is that the Asians really do understand that understanding is critical and have supported more Asian studies than, our, than we have. And I still see that. I was uh, recently in Chicago with, a group with the uh, Minister of Education from uh, China, as well as, uh, as about uh, uh, 10 American universities, I guess about five American university presidents, about 50 Chinese university presidents. And the amount of money they're putting into their institutions to encourage Americans to better understand and to learn Chinese and to better understand China and so forth is really extraordinary. Uh, the partnership that exists there is a very encouraging one, in my judgment. Uh, and uh, I do think we need, as a, as a society, and I don't mean just our federal government or our state government, but I mean corporations, I mean donors, everybody, we need to step up and match that, uh, because this is, this is really critical for the future of the United States and for the future of the world, uh, because we, we have the people who could address these problems. I, on a daily basis, just stunned with our students and how optimistic they may be about the world. We need to work to give them the tools to do what they're capable of doing so that this discussion 20 years from now will be very happy when all these issues will be resolved um, uh, and the PLA will be speaking to everybody and they will be all be happy and we'll have a very short panel and go to, go to dinner after a great <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm trying to be. Uh, I'm going to be very brief uh, so that uh, I can uh, leave the uh, difficult parts to general. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, some of the questions that I don't think I'm in any better position to answer. But first of all, on uh, U.S. role uh, in China-Japan relations. Well, I I hate to. Uh, I mean, uh, spend so many energy on the third country uh, uh, because my responsibility here is to promote U.S.-China relations. But I think this is a legitimate question because there are much more uh, third country factors involved in U.S.-China relations. So 
if we want to get this relationship right, we have to deal with the third country factor properly. And China Japan relations obviously is one of one of them. Um, uh, I, I think it is of course not in the interest of the United States that the uh, second largest and the third largest economies in the world uh, should be involved in a risk of uh, conflict uh, with each other. And certainly it's understandable that uh, the US would uh, try to uh, uh, work on this relationship. Um, but I think it's also important that uh, uh, while managing or trying to offer some hope uh, to the China-Japan relationship, uh, it's important to keep in mind that uh, the U.S. should not take sides on this. And uh, we are happy to see that the uh, administration time and again we need to wait that uh, it's not going to be uh, a mediator between China and Japan, and it's, it's not going to take sides. I think that's the uh, right uh, statement. Um, but of course, uh, we do hope that the U.S. can uh, do some part in persuading Japan to recognize that there is a sovereignty dispute over Bonnie and Island, which is a fact. I mean, the denying of this fact is obviously uh, not a sincere gesture <coughs> to talk with each other. And secondly, I think it is perhaps important for the U.S. to urge Prime Minister Abe not to uh, visit Yasukuni shrine, which is not only an offense to China, but also uh, an offense to its neighboring countries. And I think that at a larger, to, to a larger extent, it's a offense to the international community. So um, <coughs> we hope that uh, Prime Minister Abe is a good friend um, as far as uh, Taiwan question uh, is concerned, I, I find it difficult to agree with uh, President Yang guys because of U.S. ambiguity, ambiguity <laughs> on uh, Taiwan that uh, helped two sides to come closer. Uh, I think it's, it's perhaps uh, a basic belief that we should not go against Time. We should go along with the trend and the time. That the only way to, I mean, to resolve uh, uh, this uh, issue of unification is by, I mean, talking to each other, by working closer to each other, by understand more about each side. So I think this, this is we're happy to see that this belief becomes a mainstream across uh, Taiwan trade. And this, I think, is a fundamental factor that uh, we can see a warming up of our relationship uh, across the Taiwan Strait. On um, humanitarian uh, disaster relief, I think we are already doing some uh, cooperation on this. Uh, uh, I would call that uh, last uh, August. Summertime, it was uh, in the summertime last year that uh, PLA, PLA uh, uh, soldiers went to Hawaii to conduct a uh, drone military exercise in this regard. And we do see a lot of great potential in this regard, either uh, in the framework of a bilateral uh, relationship or in a multilateral way, for example, in the uh, ASEAN uh, regional forum. Uh, I think we are talking a lot about this uh, 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 potential. So uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, we're going to see more uh, cooperation between our two militaries on disaster relief. Uh, perhaps not in China, I don't know, because <laughs> in China. Um, I, I still believe that uh, we have the capability. We are much more, uh, we are very experienced in doing that work. And perhaps we should rely on ourselves, but of course, uh, uh, once we uh, need the uh, outside help, we will not hesitate to, to do that, and we're happy that the uh, U.S. Uh, time and again play a very constructive role uh, in this regard. 
suppose uh, there is uh, one case that uh, we were frustrated that um, when uh, the Sichuan earthquake uh, took place, we asked USI to uh, supply uh, with us uh, with the spare parts of the uh, black car and mountain. But that was blocked I mean, by the legislation. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was a great disappointment uh, to the Chinese side. Um, but on, I mean, third countries, on ASEAN countries, for example, uh, which uh, are very often hit by the uh, natural disasters, we, we can do a lot. Uh, I would imagine that uh, perhaps sometime in the future, uh, we can do some cooperation in, in Philippines. I mean, both uh, PLA and US uh, Navy uh, went into the uh, Philippines to offer our help uh, when uh, it was hit by IEN. Uh, so maybe sometime we can do some cooperation uh, instead of just, just acting alone, right? <coughs> On um, Korean Peninsula unification, I think as a country, uh, or, or, or perhaps the only country, only major countries in the world which has a unification problem, we can fully understand aspirations of our Korean friends. And for us, solo as is a peaceful one, is a voluntary one. I think we don't have any uh, objections to that. We are not going to say, uh, stay uh, in the way. That's not our options. Uh, and finally, about climate change and energy. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, area where our two countries are in uh, cooperations. And uh, I know uh, Secretary of State uh, uh, John Kerry uh, is a big fan of uh, climate change and he personally is very much involved in both the uh, bilateral cooperation in this regard. And we did uh, come up with a lot of uh, concrete results on this. And it's going to be a, I mean, uh, an area where we need to have further cooperations. It's not just because it's important for uh, the sustainable uh, development of our two countries, but also, I mean, as the uh, two major powers in the world, as the uh, two uh, members of the Security Council, uh, we ought to play a bigger role in, I mean, uh, coping with uh, climate change. We need to take up our responsibilities. We're, uh, I just want to be conscious of focused time. I'll try to be as short as possible. Can you still go ahead? Yeah, briefly. Just as uh, briefly as possible, you know, the digital revolution, uh, it's a great question because, uh, you know, the internet can be used for good or bad. And it's changed completely. Of course, we know it's changed businesses. The first place it changed was the military. We used to have single command and control, very strictly, and we can't do that anymore. Now we use mission command. We want power people and we trust because you have to, or you're always a step behind. Uh, and while the army and all the military is shrinking, uh, coming out of two wars, one area that's not is cyber. Uh, we're growing in cyber because of these threats, and that's something that we cooperate with lots of nations, and the Pacific's gonna have to figure out cyber to prevent, because it can be a non-state actor that causes, and nobody knows who caused it, it can bring a lot of economies and folks uh, to their knees in trouble, so cyber's key. Uh, Minister Councillor Leo hit it exactly right. We work together on, in fact, medical disaster response, those issues are the easiest to work together on, and we are and will continue to grow in that and have in the past. Uh, and I, I agree that North Korean people benefit the most from a united peninsula and learn a nation language, great advice. And uh, finally, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, I agree with the ambiguity and diplomacy. You know, no one, you know, we, as soldiers, uh, military, we have to prepare for the worst. But no one prays for peace other than a soldier or a military because we face the consequences of war. And no one prays for peace harder, I'll tell you that. So diplomacy is the way to go. And, uh, I'm glad, glad to hear that. Finally, you know, rebalance, like many other new ideas, started a little bumpy, a little slow, uh, like many new ideas do. Uh, but I, I predict, I'm an optimist also, sir, and I, I predict uh, that we'll just see tremendous, I think it's a tremendous decision, and we'll see amazing benefits. 
for all of the nations in the Pacific from rebounds and uh, prosperity. I think it'll be uh, one of the best decisions uh, ever made. So thanks for the opportunity to participate here. And, uh, uh, and again, thanks to the University of Washington for the, this opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And thanks to the panel members. Vice Chancellor of the JWR Central will say a few closing. Very few. But I mean, actually, my, my closing words are quote, actually, it's a quote. Um, we can surge troops, but we can't surge trust. True words were never spoken, and I'm going to use that to make <laughs> still that. Um, I'd like to first thank you for coming uh, and participating in great questions. I thought it was brilliant to combine the last four questions. Um, because there's some interconnections among them. If those of you who have time, we have this all for a while, we're going to kind of disperse now. But, um, you know, we're primarily sitting in groups of somewhat similar communities. And if you have time to actually reach out and touch, touch shake someone's hand in a different community um, and ask the question and engage this interaction, that would be actually a wonderful use of the final moments you know, that we have in this hall. So thank you for coming. Uh, President Young, Minister Councilor Liu, and General Brown, thank you very much for some really good responses to your questions. I think that really kind of things. And Professor Sala, thank you very much. Have a good evening.